Welcome to the show, Patrick. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. So I wanted to just start off briefly by talking about your background. I know you didn't study writing formally, and but you've also said that you knew early on that you would eventually give writing a try. How did you know that? Uh, I started reading a lot when I was a young boy, and uh, my father gave me a lot of books to read, and um, he did me the service of giving me adult books, even though I was not an adult myself. So I was reading beatnik, beatnik books and... Um, you know, Jack Kerouac and stuff like that when I was 12 and 13. Wow. And, um, what did you think of Kerouac? I mean, was, was there stuff in Kerouac that you didn't understand at that point? There was a lot of stuff that I did not understand, but it was very exciting, and I was looking forward to it all, you know. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Did you uh-huh. read Bukowski back then as well? Yeah, there was a lot of that in the house. And then, um, you know, Richard Brodigan and Charles Portis and Hubert Selby and people like that. And, and, when you, and you educated yourself, really, when you decided that you wanted to be a writer, right? I guess so. I mean, I think everyone ultimately educates themselves, whether they go to college or not. But I knew from about 17 that I was going, that I wanted to write novels. And so it was just a question of, you know, working it out in terms of, you know, sitting in front of a typewriter or uh, what became a computer and then um, reading a lot, you know, spending a lot of time in the library and stuff like that. So When you were reading those books, were you looking at the... Were you trying to kind of figure out the structure of the stories, or was it more of the style that you were looking for? I remember perking my ears up when something would move me, when I felt, um, you know, uncomfortable, or if I felt, um, you know, sad, or if I felt happy, or if I laughed, or... Any sort of an emotion at all, I remember at a certain point I thought, well, I should probably pay attention to why this is making me feel that way. Mm -hmm. And um, not necessarily taking notes, just sort of maybe it would be a section that I would reread and then hopefully, you know, assimilate in some way. Yeah. It's funny that you mentioned uncomfortable because um, I I watched Terry, the the film that that you wrote the screenplay for, and also reading this book, and you have an unbelievable skill for creating... uh, Making you uncomfortable? (laughs) Well... That's what um, you're going to say, right? Well, no, it's it's tension. It's this tension that actually... I mean, I I found myself periodically saying, "Uh uh-oh, out loud as I was reading the book. What what is that? What is that skill? Mm, I don't know. Um, It's funny, with Terry, um, I watched it all the way through one time at the first festival it was at. And then since then, I've been to a few other festivals and I was, you know, supposed to watch it, but you don't really have to watch it if you don't want to. And so you come in at the end and um, the last 15 minutes of that movie to me are really harrowing and horrible. And I found that I was really kind of revolted by it. And not because I think it's bad, but um, when I sit down and I watch a film or if I sit down and read a book and I'm made um, uncomfortable or, or, or I feel awkward... I feel animosity and hostility towards the creator and <laughs> because I feel that way all the time in my regular life and I don't want to feel that way when you watch art in my leisure time <laughs> and so, so that, you... I, that I'm doing that to all you people I don't know why I'm doing that and I apologize I'm really <laughs> sorry mm. well when you did you feel that way toward yourself were you mad at yourself because you'd made yourself I mean adolescence was a mess for me and 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 and, and and, um, you know, young adulthood was a mess for me, as it was for really all my friends. Yeah, it was about a really awkward, you know, outcast kid. Yeah, I mean, no, I mean, and, and, and I had lots of friends, and, like, high school was fine for me. I had friends and girlfriends and stuff like that, and it was fine, but just looking back, you realize, I mean, you're so full of energy at that period of your life, and um, there's no rest, really, you know? You never really rest, and... And you think you know everything, which is, I yeah. think, the big, you know, mistake of that entire period, the big black spot in that entire period of, of everyone's life is that you think you're really smart and you have no <laughs> idea that you're actually really, really stupid. You know? Right, at that age, absolutely. And maybe that's just helps the whole process, because if you knew how dumb you were, then you'd probably, we would all die, you know, yeah. kill ourselves. <laughs> So, anyway, <laughs> but I look back on that period of time and I recognize it as a very, you know, serious, um, scary time, you know, yeah. really, like s- sincerely uh, frightening period of, of time for, for most anyone, you know, even no matter where you're at, you know, on the social spectrum of uh, young adulthood, it's, um, you know, it's, it can be harsh. 
Well, overall, there were, there were definitely moments that, that were hard to watch in the film, but overall, reading your book is, is wonderful. Watching the movie, of, you know, overall, it feels g- good, right? And, and well, that's what, is yeah. that your goal? Well, I, I, don't, I don't have one goal in mind, but if I watch a movie, Todd Solondz is a good example, where I feel like the director or whoever it is, the writer, has a really low opinion of humanity... I tend to bristle against that. Yeah. And that doesn't... I'm not looking for that, you know. Yeah. If anything, I want the far opposite of that. And um, so even though there are moments in in my work where um, things are awkward and uncomfortable and maybe ugly sometimes, I consider myself optimistic and and, and, um, I would hope that that is reflected in my work, you know. If you're just tuning in, you're listening to Live Wire Radio, and we're talking with author Patrick DeWitt. Um, I, I, and we're talking about the, the, the Sisters Brothers. And uh, when you talk about uh, still having hope, <laughs> you know, still being hopeful, you clearly really care about uh, the character of Eli in this book. Um, he is, he's one of the brothers, and he's the, he's the narrator of the book. And I wonder if you can read a little bit, because I feel like his voice is so... Distinct, and I'd love for people to be able to hear him a little bit. Yeah, I'd be glad to. Um, I'll just read the first two pages. It's quite short. Uh, and this is just, there's nothing really to set up. This is uh, the first two pages of the book. The section is called Trouble with the Horses. And here we go. I was sitting outside the Commodore's mansion, waiting for my brother Charlie to come out with news of the job. It was threatening to snow, and I was cold. And for want of something to do, I studied Charlie's new horse, Nimble. My new horse was called Tub. We did not believe in naming horses, but they were given to us as a partial payment for the last job, with the names intact, so that was that. Our unnamed previous horses had been immolated, so it was not as though we did not need these new ones, but I felt we should have been given money to purchase horses of our own choosing, horses without histories and habits, and names that they expected to be addressed by. I was very fond of my previous horse, and lately had been experiencing visions while I slept of his death, his kicking, burning legs, his hot, popping eyeballs. He could cover 60 miles in a day like a gust of wind, and I never laid a hand on him except to stroke him or clean him, and I tried not to think of him burning up in that barn But if the vision arrived uninvited, how was I to guard against it? Tub was a healthy enough animal, but would have been better suited to some other, less ambitious owner. He was portly and low-backed, and could not travel more than 50 miles in a day. I was often forced to whip him, which some men do not mind doing, and which, in fact, some men enjoy doing, but which I did not like to do, and afterwards he, Tub, believed me cruel, and thought to himself, sad life, sad life. I felt a weight of eyes on me and looked away from Nimble. Charlie was gazing down from the upper story window, holding up five fingers. I did not respond, and he distorted his face to make me smile. When I did not smile, his expression fell slack, and he moved backward out of view. He had seen me watching his horse, I knew. The morning before, I had suggested we sell Tub and go halves on a new horse, and he had agreed this was fair, but then later, over lunch, he had said we should put it off until the new job was completed, which did not make sense to me, because the problem with Tub was that he would impede the job, so would it not be best to replace him prior to? Charlie had a slick of food grease in his mustache, and he said, after the job is best, Eli. He had no complaints with Nimble, who is as good or better than his previous horse, unnamed, but then he had had first pick of the two while I lay in bed, recovering from a leg wound received on the job. I did not like Tub, but my brother was satisfied with Nimble. This was the trouble with the horses. Thank you. (laughs) That's Eli. So this, it, it, it reminded me a little bit of um, the film In Bruges. Did, how do you make people love assassins? <laughs> I think you just have to show them not assassinating people. <laughs> <laughs> and, 
and um, you know, filling out the rest of their life. If you only show a killer killing, then of course we're not going to be able to root for them. But um, you know, if you show them shopping or mm -hmm. you know, eating or you know, having insomnia or anything sure. like that, you know, then you can relate to him, and then he becomes a human being. Yeah. You know. And, and yeah, they're definitely human beings in this one. Well, it's been a pleasure having you. Um, thanks so much for joining us, and we hope that we'll see you when you come back from France with a new book. Oh, yeah, thank you very much. Thank thanks you so much, me. Patrick DeWitt. The book is The Sisters Brothers. You've been listening to a snippet of Livewire, the radio variety show that's like a chew toy for your brain. For more information about the show or to download our podcast, visit livewireradio.org.